Uh, my name is Anna Davis. I run the pro bono program here at UCI Law, although my full-time job for about the last three weeks has been putting on this conference, which has been a tremendous honor and a lot of work, and I'm really excited for today to be here. Um, so thank you for attending our third uh, UC Public Interest Legal Conference. This is an amazing opportunity and the only opportunity from, for law students from all four UC law schools to get together. And as I'm told, the only opportunity for all four law school deans and President Napolitano to all come together. It's really a special day um, and we're very excited to have you here. I do wanna let you know that I have one request from each of you today, especially the students in the room. My request is that you use today to go outside of your comfort zone. So ask questions, um, introduce yourself to people. And today there will be times when you will have the opportunity to just sit down next to somebody you have class with all week long, or you can go sit next to somebody you don't know at all and strike up a conversation. And I hope that you choose the latter. So a few logistics. We are gonna um, have three breakout session rooms after today's panel. This auditorium is one room. Just outside the door is the Huntington Room. It's very close by, and way down the hall is the Newport Room. So please, if you, uh, see it, if you look in your program and you see an amazing panel in the Newport Room, we hope you, you make the effort you, to get down there. And there are um, MCLE, for those attorneys in the room, there's MCLE credit um, for each break, during each breakout session, so please do look for that. So we're gonna, as I said, we have a lot for you today, so we're gonna stay on a tight timeline. And it is my honor to bring up um, the Dean of UCI School of Law, Song Richardson. She is the champ, oh, <laughs> we give, a give me a minute. She's, oh. uh, She's the Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Law at UCI. She's known for her scholarship on implicit bias, or excuse me, implicit racial and gender bias, and its impact on the Fourth Amendment and policing. Dean Richardson obtained her undergraduate degree from Harvard University and her JD from Yale Law School. Please join me in welcoming Dean Richardson. I will always arrange it so that I get clapped twice. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for being here this morning. It is incredible to look out and see all of you students and future leaders, former students, members of the community who are here to, to really think hard and long about the importance of public service to our world. We are at UCI Law so very, very excited to be able to host this event here uh, this year, so thank you so much. This conference has always been special to me. And it's a special time to hold this conference now for all of us because it gives us a time to build community, to bolster our commitment to public service. And then of course, because of everything that's going on across the world today, to really commiserate about the state of the world today. And as all of you who are sitting here today know, fighting for social justice is more important today than ever. And we're relying on you, both those who are already lawyers, and even more importantly, to all the students here, to all of the future leaders here, to do everything that you can to leave the world a better place than it is. That was my dream. That was why I went to law school. It's why I spent my entire career, both after law school and even after entering the academy, trying to do everything I can to make this world a better place, to do the work myself, to support those like all of you here who are doing that work too, because you're here today, because you share the dream that we share, the one that we share at UCI, the one that we share in the University of California, and the one that you share by virtue of the important work you do. And I know that sometimes it feels like we don't have enough time to do the things that we must do, and sometimes it feels completely depressing and hopeless, or at least I'll speak for myself, sometimes it feels that way <laughs> for me. But then I remind myself 
that we make time and put resources towards those things that we think are important. And so to come together today for this incredible day to build community with each other, and as Anna Davis said, to meet new people, because that community that you have is what will help you through the dark times. And very soon, uh, we'll have our uh, deans up here, along with the president, Janet Napolitano. And when I talk about building community, I just have to say, because we say this to all of you students all the time, each and every one of the deans that will be sitting here today, we all know each other from outside of our deanships. Right? That's how these relationships work. So I again want to reiterate what Anna Davis said. Please reach out to people you don't know and start to broaden your communities. So why are we here then? Well, four years ago, the four UC law schools asked President Napolitano to help us help our students achieve their dreams of a career in public service. And of course, President Napolitano did not need to agree with us. She didn't need to say yes, but she did. So President Napolitano understood that it was critically important for the University of California system to provide financial support for tomorrow's public service advocates. And out of that commitment was born the President's Public Service Law Fellowship Program. And this program has been an enormous success. I mean, just look at all of you in this room. It gives us such great pleasure to see all of you here. And we were just speaking to a law student who said the reason she came to UCI and to the University of California system was because she had read about President Napolitano's commitment to public service. And now, across all four schools, the funds for this program have supported approximately 425 summer fellowships and 60 postgraduate fellowships each year. Now, as all of you know, President Napolitano has, well, the first thing you may not know is she is the president, the only president in the UC system that has provided this kind of support for the very important public service work that we do. As all of you know, President Napolitano has announced that she will be stepping down this year. I will formally introduce her in a moment, but I would like to ask all of you here today to please give a very warm thank you for all that President Napolitano has done in support of public service in the University of California system. Can we please do that now? And we can only really hope, President Napolitano, that whoever our new president is or will be will show the same leadership and the same commitment to public service that you have shown throughout your entire career and for the University of California system. So thank you again. So before introducing our first speaker, there are a number of people that we have to thank for bringing us all together. So Stephanie Beecham, she's the Executive Communications Specialist for UCOP. Can you raise your hand? Thank you. And then all the logistics of this conference were coordinated by staff from the UCI Law School and from the Beckman Center. They are Jillian Henry, who's UCI's Events Coordinator. There's Brittany Taylor for Experiential Learning Programs and Coordinator at UCI Law. And there's Katrina DeCastro, who's responsible for event planning for the Beckman Center. If you're in the room, would you please raise your hand and let's thank the three of them too. They're not in the room because they're doing all the hard work outside. <laughs> And then representatives from all four of the UC law schools have worked very hard to ensure that there are interesting and impactful and relevant breakout sessions. And they are Sarah Milan from UC Berkeley, Sophia Perino from UC Davis, 
Anna Davis, who you heard from, from UCI, and Karen Wang from UCLA. Can we please give them a hand? And please raise your hand if you're here. Finally, I want to thank all of you for being here. To the students, you are our future. We are relying on all of you. So thank you so much for being here. And then for all of the presenters, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedules to be here on a Saturday, the first day of the Lunar New Year, to share with us your expertise. And then there's one person I have to call out, and I'm so sorry to have to do this, but I have to because he is the chair of our UCI Law Board of Visitors who's sitting in the back of the room, Rich Bridgeford. I really want to thank you for your support throughout the years uh, for our school. So thank all of you for being here. Okay. Okay, finally, now we can start the actual program. I, my intent today is to keep the bios very short. So don't let the shortness of the bios uh, make you think that the people that we are introducing are not unbelievable in their own rights and you can look up, um, you can look them up and get a more detailed bio. But it gives me incredible pleasure to introduce Brooke Weitzman. She is one of the many shining examples of how University of California law school graduates have used their legal training to improve the lives of others. She is a member of the third class at UCI Law, and her commitment to public service is simply unparalleled. She has far too many accomplishments for someone who's graduated uh, in 2014 for me to list today, so let me just highlight this. After she graduated from UCI Law in 2014, she co-founded the Elder Law Disability Rights Center, which is the first sliding scale legal services organization in Orange County. Brooke is one of Orange County's strongest champions for the rights of the homeless and has received numerous awards for her litigation in federal court on their behalf. She is, she is an incredible graduate of our law school, an amazing alumnus, uh, an exemplar for what it means to be committed to public service. Please welcome Brooke Weitzman to the stage. Whoever was scheduling that decided I should go between Dean Richardson and all the deans, I think maybe I need to have a talk with. Um, so, um, so, I, so, so, like you just heard, right? So, I was in your seat a few years ago as a recent graduate. Um, I came to the UC system because of the commitment and because of the new UCI Law School and because of the social justice minded folks I talked to when I was figuring out where to go and had the opportunities that you all are having to connect with people in my school, in other schools, um, lawyers who were committed to coming back and investing their time and their money in all of you to create the next generation of amazing public interest lawyers to do service and to fight for justice. Um, and the need for that does continue to grow. It is great to see that UCI, and particularly through President Napolitano, has continued that commitment and that we now see not just the words of commitment, but the, the financial resources and the time to back it up, right? The ongoing opportunity to bring you all together. And, and I know you already heard it twice, but I'm going to echo what you heard before. Go shake a stranger's hand and trade information because your network will be everything as you come up in your legal career, as you get to meet more lawyers, um, and as you see what opportunities there are for you. So when I graduated, um, I started off doing an Equal Justice Works Fellowship at the Public Law Center here in Orange County, and I quickly found that there were a lot of people that we weren't serving, that we felt that there was a gap in the justice system, there were people we were turning away every day, either because they were a little over income or a little under senior, um, or they had the type of need that couldn't be met in the kind of traditional legal services. And I actually went to a lawyer I had worked for as a law student at UCI and said, I have this idea, I think I might just go and start a civil rights practice where I can serve who I want and I can help the homeless community because that's something that I've always been really passionate about. And he said, well, you could, or we could partner up, I could quit the job I've had for 30 years and we could start a sliding scale org. <laughs> and so of course we did that. <laughs> um, 
And so since then, over the past three years, we've really had the opportunity to serve, to both to serve thousands of people and to fight for justice in Orange County and to be leaders in the creation of thousands of shelter beds that save hundreds of lives. Um, but more importantly, to continue to partner with the UCs. So this program and this system has funded fellows, postgraduate fellows, summer stipends, the, the postgraduate loan forgiveness assistance, um, all of which have helped people to come to the Elder Center and to other comparable organizations to do good work. Um, so when, when these fellowships fund our graduates, they fund UC graduates, they're not only giving you all or the recipients this kind of career springboard, the opportunity to start working before you get your bar results, which we know is much harder in public interest and government work than in private practice. Um, but through that, they are serving the hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals that you will serve during that first year of your career. And they're serving organizations like the Elder Center, small nonprofits that are growing and giving us the synergy we need to grow quicker, to bring on more attorneys, and to build up sustainable programs that we can then hire all of you to keep running. Um, so this program is really critical, both for, for you, for the people you'll have the opportunity to serve, and for organizations like ours. Um, so with that, I just want to thank the, thank the, the president and the UC system again, remind you all to take advantage of these opportunities throughout today as you go to the different panels. There are, there are a lot of really amazing attorneys speaking, some UCI alumni, some people who have hired UCI alumni, or who work with UCI alumni, or all of the UC systems. A lot of the local people are the ones I know best. Um, and so, the, so, so take the opportunity to meet those people and to talk with them all. Um, so that you can take advantage of those networks too. When you, when you go to a panel and you hear someone today who says something that means a lot to you, go meet that speaker after the panel. Um, and be sure, finally, to thank your deans for participating. Like you heard, this is the one time of year that these deans with this commitment to public service get together. And we want to be sure that they know how much we all appreciate the time that they all take away to be a part of this program and to show that this is a priority for all of our UC system schools. Um, so thank your deans, learn everything, and then everyone should just go out and change the world. <laughs>
Dean Chemerinsky attended Harvard for both his undergrad and law school degrees. Kevin Johnson is the dean, the maybe a pious professor of public interest law, and a professor of Chicana Chicano Studies at UC Davis Law. He has made an impact through his scholarship on immigration and civil rights. He earned his undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley and his JD from Harvard Law School. Jennifer Manukin is the Dean and David... Jennifer Manukin is the Dean and David G. and Dallas P. Price Professor of Law at UCLA Law. She is known for her impactful scholarship on evidence, forensic science, and the Confrontation Clause. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard, her JD from Yale Law School, and her PhD in History and the Social Study of Science and Technology from MIT. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here this morning. All right, is this on? <laughs> okay. I am uh, pleased to be here. It's great to see everybody feel the energy in the room. Uh, uh, how many of you are, are students right now, law students right now? Wow. All right, excellent. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna grill your deans. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna start. I'm just gonna start with Dean Shemarinsky, and we'll come down the row. Uh, but Dean, uh, um, do you think law schools today do enough to prepare students for careers in public service? No. But before I go any further. <laughs> I want to say what an enormous pleasure it is to be here, to be part of the panel, and I want to echo everything that Song said in thanking President Napolitano for creating this program, the summer fellowships, the postgraduate fellowships, and of course, the support for the program that we're part of today. The answer to that question, President Napolitano, has to be no. The reality is we don't have enough scholarship money available to help facilitate students being able to go to law school without crushing debt. We don't provide enough money during the summer for students to be able to do public interest work in many instances. We don't have enough in the way of postgraduate fellowships to facilitate it. We all have loan forgiveness programs. We're all improving our loan forgiveness programs, but they don't do nearly enough. I also worry about all the things that occur during law school that may channel students not intentionally, maybe inadvertently, away from careers in public interest law. And we need to always think of the things that we can do as law schools to reinforce for our students who want to pursue careers in public interest law, how to do it, and to help them get those jobs. Dean Manukin. I also want to reiterate my thanks to you, President Napolitano, for the program that you created and for the ways that you supported uh, the law schools and public interest at the law schools in a really passionate and, and powerful way. It means a great deal to our schools and to us and to our alums and students. Um, I don't think we do enough. I do think we are trying. So I guess I would agree with everything that Irwin says. I, I, I'd start with, with scholarships. I mean, I recognize that uh, the, the cost of a legal education is daunting, especially when uh, framed against the salaries uh, in public interest. And, um, and I think that's a serious challenge. And that while our loan forgiveness programs really do make a difference there, um, it's still a challenge. And it's still a challenge to take on debt with uncertain futures and not know what's going to come next um, in that regard. And so I think that's a, that's a very real challenge. I also think there's a set of systemic factors that, um, that operate in really unfortunate ways, including, for example, those uh, surveys that treat average salary as if it's a mark of the distinction of a law school. 
So that means that if a law school sends a great many people into extraordinary public interest opportunities where they're going to change the world, forego a lot of income, but to make a difference and to follow their passions, the law schools are hurt in that assessment metric or mechanism. And that's just one of a number, right? Those operate outside our law schools, but they also affect our law schools. And I think that's something that should be very much part of our collective conversation. These fellowships, the postgraduate fellowships that we are able to offer in significant um, part because of the generosity of the system, something that we're so proud of in this system, something that we're drawing attention to, something that for many of you affected where you chose to go to law school. In the main rankings vehicle, US News and World Report, they don't count as a full job because um, because of how they choose to structure things. They count as you know, three quarters of a job or whatever else. That's wrong. That is just wrong and it's a structural disincentive against, um, against public interest opportunities. Um, so, so I agree that we aren't doing as much as I wish we could, but I also think that the UC law schools are doing more than almost anyone else out there. There are some other law schools that are also doing more. I don't want to suggest it's the UC law schools alone. But I do think that all four of these law schools are making it a serious institutional priority, supporting our students in significant ways. Not perfectly, but we are trying. And so I think we should, we should recognize and acknowledge that too. Dean Johnson. Well, thanks for this opportunity and uh, thanks for this wonderful program and I want to thank all the students uh, and others for, for being here today. Uh, I, I agree with uh, my, my, my deans to my left. Um, I think that uh, we're not doing all we can do, uh, but we are doing more than we have done in the past. I think this is something that we're paying attention to uh, and that we're trying to improve. I think that all the deans on this panel are working hard to raise money for scholarships, uh, to expand our loan repayment assistance programs, to create the institutional structures to help and make it as easy as possible to, to get public service work. One of the, the, the challenges is that, you know, that the private sector is very good about funding itself, reaching out to students, and we have to create structures to make sure that we connect you all with the public interest employers who don't have the resources to invest in that kind of reaching out opportunity. I'd also encourage you to think about possible public service work, maybe not in Los Angeles or in San Francisco, but there are all parts of the state. Rural poverty and rural organizations are, are uh, I don't wanna say dying for people, but they're, they have a hard time getting lawyers to go work out in uh, the, the, the less populated parts of the, parts of the state, uh, and even in the in the time of the you know the 2008 recession, uh, I had a real devil of a time trying to convince some students interested in public defense work that it wasn't the end of the world to go work in Fresno or in Reading, uh, get a couple of years of experience, and move move to other cities where they might want to be or maybe not. Um, um, I, but I do think um, there is a role for students like you to play. Uh, in all this, I do think that, um, I don't want to say any of the deans, including myself, are dishonest, but you can let us know what's important and how we can help and give us ideas and um, keep us honest, in a sense. I do think we hear a lot from students. I like to say I get lots of input all the time, uh, and I, I, I do. Uh, but we also need to hear from you all about what we can do, how to make things work. Sometimes. I found I, I, that some of the, the best ideas that um, uh, I've, that have come to me have been from students, uh, maybe not in, in um, uh, implementable form at the outset, but in the end, uh, things have worked out. So I, I'd encourage you to uh, share your thoughts, share your ideas, let the deans, uh, um, um, I, although I like the, the first concept of, uh, from the last speaker, thank your deans. I think you should do that. Uh, but I also, I, I, but I also think uh, providing input is incredibly important. And, uh, and when something goes well, too, actually, another thing I think we could all agree on is we rarely hear from people when things are going well. Uh, we tend to hear from people when they're. Oh, I know that. <laughs> so, uh, if you think a program like this is a good program, let people know about this program. 
I'm hopeful that this program continues with the next president, uh, and, I, and I hope that students like yourselves let it be known how important this program is and how much it's needed both to recruit students and to encourage this kind of work uh, and help the people of the state and, and elsewhere. <clears throat> So unfortunately, I get to go last, and the reason I say that is because everything uh, that my friends on this panel have already said is what I would have said. So I will, um, and it's true, I had my list, and then I, I crossed it all off, so I'm not going to repeat everything that's already said. I sign on to all of it, and I, and I guess the, the thing that I want to say then is obviously, no, we aren't doing enough. Uh, and it is the, so I'll tell you what keeps me up at night, um, because my entire career was being one of you, right, being a public interest lawyer, and I was so privileged to be able to do that because of the loan forgiveness program that I had and then the fellowship I was able to get. And without those two things, I simply could not have afforded to do this work and have the launching pad to spend my entire career doing public interest work within uh, an organization that focuses on that, which is why I want to add to everything that's been said that the reason we frame it and the reason I begun talking about more generally public service versus public interest is because there are going to be people here that simply can't afford to do public interest work. And I know what that's like. You have families, you don't have the resources, you simply can't, the law school tuitions, are incredibly high, your loans are unbelievable. And so recognizing all of that, I hope that each and every one of you, as we think about the work that we do, whether you're able and lucky enough to work in the public interest or you're in the private sector to remember the importance of public service and the importance of looking back and lifting up People. And remember it with your law schools, when, especially if you're in the private sector, when, you, when your law schools call you up and what you want to do is hang up the phone and oh, not speak because you're so worried what we're going to say is, will you contribute back to your law school? And so we are not doing enough, but we ask all of you to do and contribute too. And I'm not trying to turn this on to you because, I, like I said, this is something that keeps me up at night, but we can all contribute to this important work that we do, and we up here can all do better. And that is what, why we need all of you. I love it, maybe not right at the time, but after I think about it, when all of my students come to me to tell me all of the things that we are not doing, please continue to do that. Because it's your ideas, your creativity, and you're the ones who are out there now. Please tell us what we can do better. And also, think about the things that you can do, especially if you've already graduated, to help the students who are currently in law schools, to help us do a better job at what we're doing. And the final thing I'll say, because it was already mentioned, US News is the bane of my <laughs> existence. <laughs> but, <laughs> but. But I'm, I'm saying it to you because I'm going to issue a challenge to all of you in this room. U.S. News, as Dean Manukin said, places lots of pressure on law schools. And I wanted to not pay attention to it at all. And then I started hearing from you, the students who care very much about the rankings that we have. And then I hear from employers and I hear from alumni and I realize everyone cares. And if you and the students who are coming up would stop caring about the <laughs> rankings, because they have perverse incentives, they really, really, really do. And I wish there would be a movement, a grassroots movement from you and students applying to law schools to say that one individual, whose name I won't say right now, who, who basically builds the algorithm that tells us what should matter, and public service is not one of those things that matter, why should he have that power? And you have way more power than we up here to say, enough, we're done. What we care about are those schools that really care about public service. That's where we're going to go. 
That's what we're going to do. Who cares what US News and World Report says about the way that they rank? This is you. You have the power to start doing this. So use, I'm going to say Instagram, tweet, whatever. I don't, social media, I'm not good at social media. But use those platforms. Start doing it. Create that movement. Say, we don't care what you have to say, US News. What we care about are the things that matter to us. Go to the school that does the things that you care about. But it is easy to say that and hard to do. So my challenge to you is let's start building that movement because you have the power to begin it. Thank you. All right. So so we've got the money challenge. We've uh, uh, got uh, the... um, uh, incipient revolution against U.S. News and World Report. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, let me uh, ask the uh, question in another way. Do um, you think the curricula that you offer at the law schools um, uh, uh, focuses enough on or uh, uh, prepares uh, students or introduces students adequately uh, to the concept of working uh, in the public service uh, arena? Uh, or do you think uh, that the curricula uh, more drives students to what I would uh, stereotype as kind of the private sector practice uh, of law? And um, if you were to make any changes in your curricula uh, so that the curricula marries with uh, the um, rhetoric that we use in support of public service, what changes would you, uh, would you consider making, right? Um, so uh, to mix it up, I will start with We'll start with Dean Manukin. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would say that at my law school at UCLA, I actually think we have a very broad and deep set of curricular opportunities for our public interest students. We also have an admissions program, the the Epstein program in um, public interest law and policy um, that some students arrive being part of and those students have um, even in their 1L class a a lawyering skills class that is focused on public interest um, in particular as well as a uh, a chance for a class uh, with the other uh, Epstein students to talk about these issues really in their first year. A number of additional students transfer into the program. And I will say one of our institutional challenges is that um, it is more competitive to get into the Epstein program than it is to get into the Yale Law School, right? I mean, truly, in terms of numbers, we get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants. And so we have many public interest-minded students at our school who are incredibly passionate about public interest and who don't begin in that program. Everything is available to those students except that first year class opportunity. Um, And throughout our curriculum, we actually, I think, have a pretty extraordinary array of of courses taught by core faculty members, as well as incredible um, practitioners. Our experiential opportunities in our clinical program are also really, uh, I think, strong and broad. We sometimes almost have the opposite problem for some of our public interest students. I will describe. Um, Let's take a course like tax. There are many of our public interest students who may not choose to take the basic tax class because they know they want to go into public interest work. It doesn't feel that relevant. It's not what they're interested in. And we certainly don't require it. I was really struck when a fabulous alum of ours, who's been the head of Betsedic for the last uh, five years, um, came and talked at the law school a couple of years and talked to our students and talked about how tax was one of the most useful courses she'd taken during her time in law 
law school. And some of the students in that room heard that and were shocked, right? That was not what they expected to hear from the amazing Jesse Kornberg, president of Betsetic, president and CEO of Betsetic, um, you know, public interest luminary. And so I do think that one of the challenges in a curriculum, three years is long, but it's also short, right? The first year is largely structured. Um, is how to balance your passion interests with some skills building that may turn out to be really helpful even in a public interest career that may not be obvious. You know, when you're in the trenches doing um, your first few public interest jobs, tax may not be important to you. But if you come to take on um, a more senior leadership role in a nonprofit organization, it really may be quite important. Um, so, so helping us talk to you about those, that, that degree of balance so that you can make the choices that help launch you in the short term and the long term is something that I think maybe we could do a better job of than we are right now. Dean Johnson. I'll tell you a secret. Um, and the secret is if I uh, want to uh, derail the faculty for an entire year, I will bring up the subject of first-year curriculum reform. <laughs> and for the entire year, there'll be proposal and proposal and proposal, and in year five, uh, we may have a, a change. So what I'm saying is curricular reform is very difficult. I do think that it's important, and we should always pay attention to whether our curriculum directly or indirectly funnels students into particular areas. Uh, we, um, and I think we should do better, uh, at UC Davis, but I do think we are doing some things. We just uh, reformed our first year curriculum to add a skills component uh, that uh, includes exposure to lawyers from a variety of different practice area, including public interest law uh, and, and government law. And the idea is for, for students to see uh, and understand better what those lawyers do and what their work life is like and what skills are necessary for that. Uh, that's been in place for a year, and I think it's fair to say and some students are probably here, it may not have been as well received as we had hoped in the first year. Um, but, but, but in any event, it, 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 you know, that, that was our goal, is to try to expose students to all different kinds of careers. I mean, we also have some institutional structures similar, somewhat similar to UCLA. We have a you know, public interest law certificate program, a public interest um, a pro bono program. We have a public interest graduation with a Martin Luther King Jr. Service Award winner. We have a variety of structures like that. And, and at the same time, we, we have a variety of classes, um, uh, and I try to bring in, I'm president of the Board of Directors of Legal Services of Northern California, and I bring in somebody every year, usually it's the executive director, sometimes it's the vice executive director, uh, and to teach class, in, in part so he gets to know our students, and, and, and he hires our students every year, some of our students. Uh, this year, actually, I was disappointed that only five people were enrolled in the class when uh, I know that if there are 25, that a good chunk of those may have been able to get jobs in, in, the, in the very near future. Um, so I, I, I think there's more that we can think about in how to mainstream and make feel normal and make feel supported uh, going to, to, to into public service work. We, I mean, we have a, a good chunk of our students who do, but I still think we, we probably should think and do more. Dean Richardson. So when we started UCI 10 years ago, clinics, were mandatory, thank you, Erwin Chemerinsky. Clinics are mandatory, and that is a lot because it is expensive to run a clinic, and to make them mandatory demonstrates an enormous commitment to ensuring that public interest and public service are things that people care about and put at the top of their list. And the reason the mandatory nature of clinics are so important, in my view, is Otherwise, there are people who want to get into the clinic and can't, but, and there are those who don't realize that this is the type of work that they might want to do, and they will never sign up for a clinic. And yet, if they are mandatory, all of a sudden, your world view may change in a manner it couldn't have otherwise. 
So we will continue that commitment. There is so much that we do at UCI um, that I think our curriculum is incredible. I'm not going to waste any more. I shouldn't say it's a waste of time, but I know we're running out of time. So I'm not going to list all the things we do. What I will say, though, is that we are doing what Dean Johnson just talked about. We're doing it this year. We almost have a proposal because we're doing curricular reform. So I just want to highlight uh, some of the things that we are thinking about and that the faculty um, will be voting on. And what I love about the way our committee worked is we looked at everything and we sought, sought student input. So we know what you are thinking uh, as we go through this <laughs> process. Clinics will remain mandatory, I will say that. Um, but the thing I wanted to mention that we don't do enough of, and I don't think law schools do enough of, is the world is changing right now uh, so much and so quickly, much of it because of the emerging technologies and artificial intelligence that are really impacting access to justice, our rights, in both negative and positive ways. So look out for the announcement of all the things that we're going to be doing, because it's going to be big. We've just been not disclosing it all yet, but there will be a lot coming. But what that reminds, what that triggered for me when we talked to people out in the community about if you're going to be a public interest lawyer or any type of lawyer, the new things, the new skills that we don't spend enough time doing, and that is innovation, emotional intelligence, figuring out how you can switch quickly in your own head with all the changes that are happening. We don't spend enough time teaching those skills to you, and those will be critical skills for you, regardless of the area of practice, but especially when you're doing public service work. So we are spending a lot of time thinking about that too, the quote unquote soft skills, but they're not soft. They are required. So that, that's what we are now starting to think about with our new curriculum. Dean Chimarinsky. <laughs> I would separate a discussion of the upper level curriculum from the first year curriculum. In terms of the upper level curriculum, Berkeley has a huge range of offerings that relate to public interest law. Some are more general, like course on how to be a change lawyer, but there's also courses in each specific area when I think of public interest law, whether it's anti-discrimination law, environmental law, consumer law, and like. We also have a wonderful clinical program. One of my goals as dean is to substantially expand the size of the clinical program. But there's clinics in so many different areas and a very close relationship with East Bay Community Law Center. As to the first year curriculum, we just went through curricular forum. It was a year and a half project. And the outcome of it was to take property out of the first year and make an upper level elective, to reduce the number of units for contracts and torts, and to tremendously increase the number of elective units that students have the first year. So most of the second semester is electives. So students can begin pursuing what they want. And so they can start, if they're interested in a particular area of law, with the basic courses there. But they can also take courses related to public interest law. I went to law school because I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. I never took tax. I've never regretted not taking tax. <laughs> <laughs> and I really took the courses that were things that I was passionate about. And I've had two children go to law school, and I've told them, Take the courses that you're really interested in that relate to what you want to study and that fit your passions. Now, there's one other part of this that we haven't talked about because we're focusing on the curriculum, and that's the importance of doing pro bono work in law school. Of all of the statistics about Berkeley Law School that I'm proud, the one that I'm most proud of is that last year, 92% of our first year students did pro bono work. And of all the statistics from UCI when I was proud, is that overall over 90% of our students did pro bono work while they're in law school. I think they average about 100 hours each in pro bono work. Because this is the way that you as students can be giving back to your community. This is the way you can get invaluable legal experience. And also, I hope it begins a lifelong commitment to doing pro bono work, no matter what you do in your career path. All right, so um, Dean Richardson will look forward to what comes out of UCI. Please do. <laughs> and uh, for those of you at, at, at Berkeley, uh, a little uh, freedom from having to take property is well received. Um, uh, um, I, I still remember my first day in law school at the at UVA and property, and the and the first case was 
Pearson versus Post, and <laughs> it, you know, and it was about a fox hunt and who owned the fox. And I was like, why do I care about a fox? So um, uh, I'm glad to see some reforms uh, have been undertaken. Um, let me ask you to turn on. Uh, you you all are distinguished attorneys in your own rights, uh, in your own rights and experience. Um, we're going to be talking about the university's DACA case at the at lunch, um, uh, but I'm going to ask you to uh, put on your legal advisor hats and and uh, advise uh, me as to what um, uh, e either uh, incipient case or um, legal issue. Uh, out there, do you believe the University of California ought to intervene in and um, uh, take an active uh, role in? Uh, and uh, so, um, Kevin, I'll start with you. Now that, that's a good question. Um, and I, I, I am proud uh, that the University of California has taken an active role uh, in, in immigration, and I want to say how it has done so under President Napolitano's leadership. I think that the DACA litigation is one very important place the university has intervened, but I also think that your creation of the Immigrant Legal Services Center, serving un undocumented st students and their parents on all the UC campuses was, was a major impact. And I think, um, and this is me reflecting my perspective, that the university should give careful thought how to integrate all students from all backgrounds, all immigration statuses, all race, all sexualities, and how to best integrate them so that the most successful students that they can be. And I, and I think that's a, a very difficult challenge, uh, but we're seeing incredible changes in our society right now in, in, in all kinds of different ways, not just in immigration status, uh, but in terms of, um, you know, um, you know uh, the rights of the trans community and other communities. And I think that, that the university should give careful thought to um, how to best integrate all students into the fabric of the university. Uh, is allowing ICE to interview on campus something that should, should occur or not occur? Uh, do we have to make available uh, the university to, to recruitment by all employers? I, I think even those that, that, you know, that may discriminate on the basis of sexuality and immigration status and, and other things. I, I think that, to me, those, those are significant issues that the university can be a trendsetter uh, and um, can help um, create what I would call a, a gold standard of sorts for the respect for student rights. Dean Chemerinsky. I I'm hopping around. So. <laughs> it's a Socratic, it's a Socratic style. They're reminding me of being at law school. <laughs> I've been told it's known as cold calling. <laughs> Some students come to my office and say, we can't have this cold calling. What's going on here? I want to echo what Kevin says in applauding the role that President Napolitano has taken in challenging DACA. I've been co-counsel in another case on behalf of DACA recipients that's gone up parallel with it. And so I've had the chance to see the terrific work done by the University of California and its lawyers. And the real leadership role is played with regard to DACA. I'd identify two areas. One is in terms of diversity and inclusion. I think there is no doubt there are now five justices on the Supreme Court who are going to hold that all forms of affirmative action violate equal protection. I think that there are going to be five votes to overrule Bakke and Grutter and Fisher. And so the entire country is going to have to deal with what the University of California has grappled with since Prop 209 in 1996, how to achieve diversity and inclusion in light of not being able to engage in affirmative action. And I think sometimes the University of California is too easily capitulated. I think we need to do more to push the envelope to achieve diversity. I'll give a concrete example. Most UC schools now, I think, for hiring a faculty and staff, require filling out of a diversity and inclusion statement. Um, the Pacific Legal Foundation has made clear that they are going to bring a legal challenge to these diversity and inclusion statements. I think the UC system needs to litigate this when the suits are brought and defend these 
because part of what we should be looking for in faculty are individuals who are going to be sensitive to our diverse student body, who are going to enhance the diversity of the University of California. The other set of issues that I'd point to concern the First Amendment and free speech. I think these remain some of the hardest issues that campus is going to face, that university have to litigate. And here, too, President Napolitano has been a real leader in creating the UC Center on Free Speech and Civic Engagement. Okay. Dean Mnookin. Uh, I would echo my colleagues' um, appreciation and admiration for the UC's um, engagements around DACA and the effort to, um, to, to defend the ongoing existence of DACA. I think that's um, enormously important. Uh, and I would agree with the suggestions that we've already heard. I uh, would, would I, I won't repeat what Irwin has said about affirmative action in Baki, but I do agree that the UC system may have something in particular to contribute given, um, given the experience with Prop 209 and the, um, and the the extraordinary and sometimes you know frust frustrating efforts to make diversity a priority in the face of legal structures that don't that take some very important tools out of the toolbox. Um, I, I think there are other areas that that are probably less obvious, but that um, that link to the the practice of what a university is. And I'll describe one that probably isn't on most people's minds right now, but that is affecting me and our law school right this minute. Um, California has a robust Public Records Act. This is a good thing. We want transparency. We want um, public officials to have to, to share. Uh, we shouldn't be able to do things behind closed doors and in secret. But there's ways in which it's being used as a sword against researchers doing important work and creative activities. So I have a colleague right now who's frankly getting harassed about, she, she's an environmental leader and, um, and doing incredibly important work in climate change. And she's getting harassed with a great many Public Records Act requests that are asking for enormous amounts of materials that were she at a private university would just be private. Um, but because she's at the UC, they have a claim to get all of her communications. And this is really the oil industry trying to intimidate her. And so for us as a public university, with scholars and students and faculty who are engaging in all of these areas, including public interest areas, um, for this Public Records Act to be able to be used in this way poses a serious threat to that which we are as a university. And I think it's a place where the system could um, think about engagement. Dean Richardson, advise me. <laughs> this is the time I wish I had gone first <laughs> because every single one of the issues that, that you've heard about already um, are, are critically important, so I've been racking my brain to, to think about what more I could add to what has already been said. And so, again, thank you for the work that the University of California has done in, in the DACA case and in thinking about our undocumented students and also the things that you have already done with regard to our students on campus who face um, sexual harassment, sexual assaults. Um, so, I'm sort of reluctant to say this, but I'm, but I'm not, so I will, um, which is, <laughs> and it shouldn't be a surprise just because of the, the area in which I research, but I, I will speak about the leadership that the University of California can take when it comes to thinking about how we can manage and do better at the relationship between our students and our faculty of color and law enforcement across the UC system. I have been struck over the course of my time in the UC system uh, about the ways in which people who are not in the majority, um, students and faculty who are stopped walking up and down the streets just to go to their homes or walking on campus to go to class or sitting outside a professor's office and being stopped by the police and then having police say, we don't believe that you're a student waiting for office hours. Let me wait for your professor and ask him or her if that's who you really are. Um, and these are ongoing problems. It's not just in the University of California. It is a problem of our society. 
but sadly, too many of our students and our, our faculty and our staff and our administrators have that added burden of having to worry about that when what we hope is that all of you as students can worry about your classes and being cold called um, and, and, and all of those things and not being worried about stepping outside of your door and, and having to be searched and questioned simply on your way to school. And so I hope that given how large we are, um, that we, and we've been making efforts, um, but I don't think we've been doing enough. And so if we can do that, that would be the additional thing that I hope we could focus more attention on. All right, so, so uh, uh, the issue of affirmative action, uh, the issues of inclusion, uh, the issue of the weaponization of the Public we Records Act, and, and then uh, um, police relations, uh, all areas where you think the university as an institution uh, can make, um, uh, make some uh, movement. Um, okay, uh, we have 10 minutes or so for audience questions. This is the question part of the program. There are mics on either side, so please stand at the mic and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, my name is Justine Massey, and I'm here from UC Davis. Thank you, deans, for um, adding your wisdom <laughs> to our lives. Um, I wanted to ask sort of a follow-up on the curriculum question, which is, um, have you thought about how the universities could influence what the bar tests? And how, I don't really know the history of attempts to change that. But I feel that that would have a really big impact on what people feel like they can study, how they can dedicate their time. Um, for example, immigration and environmental law is just not on the bar at all, even though there's such important aspects of many different lawyering styles and um, professions. Who wants to take the bar exam on? <laughs> Dean Manukin. Uh, so you're, okay. you've raised an issue that's pretty near and dear to my heart um, in that I've been spending some energy with some of my fellow deans, not, not yet successfully, at trying to um, encourage uh, California to move its cut score closer to the rest of the country. We're an outlier right now. We're the second hardest bar in the country. The first is Delaware. And literally, like 180 people take Delaware in July. <laughs> it's just not um, a force in the bar community the way, the, the way This California group is. could be the whole Delaware uh, Right, bar. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and it's not what you asked, but it is one point of change because this, this elevated cut score creates added pressure and tension here in California compared to um, in other states. Of course, the bar is a stressful thing everywhere, but when it's one and a half standard deviations above the national average, when there's strong evidence that this has disparate effects on, on bar takers of color with no evidence that it makes for better lawyers in any way, it's really, it's really an unfortunate thing. Um, you know, I, I, I am happy to say that we've had some really positive engagement about the possibilities for change. A set of public interest organizations and affinity bar associations have also spoken up about this. Um, even some big law folks are beginning to speak up about the importance of trying to achieve change here. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see in the next uh, year or two some, uh, some movement where California could become a little bit more like the rest of the country. You've asked a more profound question about what's on the bar exam. And I think it's also the case that the bar exam in its current form is really unjustifiable. Like there's just no reason to believe that this test accurately measures um, competency. The challenge is it's a really hard thing to measure. There's a study that's going on right this minute with results that are gonna come out in probably February or March that's been looking at what lawyers, what young lawyers are actually doing to try to say what, what, what ought to be tested. My own view is not to be in favor of starting to add things like environmental law and immigration law, not that they aren't important, but I actually think it's already testing way too many subjects and too much. I would rather see 
uh, bar exam with fewer subjects and that was a little more performance space that more asked you to use a variety of skills that, um, that lawyering asks for. And I guess I also wish that there were more faith in the accredited law schools, right? That is to say that the bar exam could be a check on things rather than this independent, massively stressful engagement where in some states like ours, you know, half of the takers are failing. So I think that's a long process, um, but I have to say I wouldn't be, a, it's not that these other subjects aren't important, but I don't think that, that throwing them into the bar exam is our best method for making them important. I agree with every word that Jennifer said, but I want to answer your question a slightly different way. You don't need to take courses in law school because the subject is tested on the bar. I've been a faculty member at five different law schools over the course of my career, and each of them did a study about what correlates to bar pass rate. And these schools have distributed along the US news spectrum. Every school found no correlation between the courses taken in law school and bar pass rate. I can talk about what does correlate to bar pass rate, but it's not whether you take a particular course. Admittedly, if you don't have a course, it's harder at the bar study stage to pick it up, but we just have been doing this at Berkeley. We did it when I was at Irvine. We found no correlation in courses taken in law school and bar pass rate. Dean Richardson. Um, so much of what I was going to say has already been said, but I just want to add to this, and it may not be a popular thing to say, but I would, following up from Jennifer's um, last point about putting more faith in the law schools and the education that we give to all of you, because I have zero faith that the bar exam tests anything um, that is required to be a minimally competent lawyer. And the reason I phrase it that way, I, well, I phrase it that way because that's how the bar phrases it, right? We're supposed to test minimum competence. But in what world is minimum competent? I mean, if you all went out there when you graduated and simply memorized everything that you did in law school to prepare for, or for the bar exam and then represented clients and cases without opening up a book and doing research to see what the law is, you would not be a minimally competent lawyer. Why do we test people's ability to memorize? I don't understand it. I do not understand what the point is of writing incredibly tricky multiple choice questions where one of the two answers are good. What are we doing? So the quite no, really, I really feel that. I don't understand it. So thank you, Jennifer and the deans who've really been taking the lead in thinking about this. And once again, I'm going to ask all of you to help us because you're the ones who are gonna to have to take the bar. Luckily, I was fabulous at memorizing things. You can give me something, I will memorize it. But what did it have to do with, am I a good analyzer of facts? Do I show empathy when I speak to my clients so I actually learn what it is that they need to do? Do I understand how to be an incredible, brilliant appellate argument or trial attorney? And what do those things have to do with enduring the bar exam. I do not know unless truly it is a barrier to entry into the legal profession. Is that what it is? So let us ask those questions. Why do we have it? What is the point? And then let's figure out what to do with it. So I, yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> Dean Johnson, you want to add, add, add anything? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'll apologize in advance for what happened last summer because the state bar is really in a mess right now after uh, a snafu that got all the bar takers up in arms. Uh, I, I do think that there should be more deference to the ABA accredited law schools. And I think that the state of California, and this is not a very popular view, should adopt a system like the state of Wisconsin yeah. where people who graduate from an from a ABA accredited law school are waived into practicing law in the state. It's, it's worked fine there. Uh, and given the problems with what is being tested, the racially disparate impact of the bar exam uh, on, our, on alums uh, and the, the cost of their careers uh, is, is unconscionable. I do think the cut score is an interesting issue and a very important one. Uh, and I think it's a political issue, really. And it's a political issue since the Supreme Court has taken over uh, the decision making about the cut score from, from the State Bar Board of Governors. And so um, my view is also that with a new justice on the, on the California Supreme Court, 
there may be a more a different political calculus on cut scores than there was in the past. All right. Another question. Okay, there we go. Um, my name is Melissa Tribble. I'm also from UC Davis Law School, and I also have a question about curriculum. Um, I noticed that none of the deans had mentioned the absence of um, legislative advocacy in our curriculum, and I feel like that neglects the fact that the legislative process um, is a really fantastic tool to create broad structural change and um, can be utilized by many people going into to public interest work, and I um, want to know why that wasn't brought up and if there is any sort of a movement to um, have legislative advocacy be more of a focus in law school. So I will raise that issue now. Um, didn't bring it up because I didn't want to repeat and continue to talk about the different classes that we have at UCI Law, but I'll mention one because I totally agree with you. Uh, that. It's not simply focusing on the courts, it's also focusing on public policy, right, and, and legislative advocacy. So we do have a course like that taught by a former state senator. Um, and we, that class continued, oh, one minute left. So I, I, I will say that finding faculty to come in to teach courses like that are critically important. We bring students, students have the first bill drafted by UCI law students from that class before the California state legislature looking at artificial intelligence and bias and what are the types of things that this legislature should be thinking about when they do that. So groups of students take bills in that class for over the, maybe not 10 years, but at least in the past since 2014, since I've been there, that has been a major class with students drafting bills, going up to Sacramento, determining what the subject matter of it is, and then helping the, the uh, assembly and senators pass that bill, or at least try to. So developing all of those skills, whether in clinics, because we have clinics that focus on that too, and I know the other schools up on this panel do too, uh, that is a, uh, area of the law that we must teach our students to be able to engage in and understand and do effectively. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Any other? Anybody else want to comment on uh, legislative advocacy in the curriculum? Okay. We're going to do one more question up here. I know we're over time, but I'm having fun. I'm having fun. So you know. she is the president. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Taylor Mangan. Um, I work for the ACLU of Hawaii on a presidential fellowship, so thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, I wanted to ask a question. I wanted to ask a question about accessibility in law school. Um, I'm sure all of you know that getting disabled students into the law school and the legal profession is a pretty huge hurdle if you are disabled. However, as a disabled individual, moving through law school was incredibly difficult um, and I think one of the reasons that is and what I've found over my time of talking to a number of disabled law students and legal professionals is that starts in law school with a lack of accommodations and a lack of general support and a lack of curriculum um, for disability rights in general. So I would like to know if you're doing anything in particular for your disabled students who have a very powerful voice um, and could be benefited by your specific attention to that issue. We've just hired somebody in our Dean of Students office to focus on accessibility for disabled students, and that is that person's full-time responsibility um, because there are so many issues throughout. Um, I think you're right. We need to have more in terms of curricular offerings with regard to rights, uh, d disability rights. Um, we had a committee last year um, focusing on these issues. And they made a number of recommendations. Some of the issues are also just physical facilities that are very difficult and enormously expensive to change, but we've got, we're trying to work on those. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, we, we hired somebody who specializes in disability rights, and she, on a daily basis, gives me input on how we can improve our accessibility for the disabled. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, she's sort of, um, she's teaching a dis disability curriculum now, and she's been very helpful. And we recently uh, hired a, a, a mental health counselor at the law school to work for full time, and we'll probably be hiring another. So we're, we're, we're trying to pay attention to some, some of those things. Um, but as always, um, you know, the, the field is evolving, and we're trying to keep up. 
I would only add that I agree that there's a great deal of work to do. I am proud that at UCLA, um, students a couple of years ago uh, began the first disability-focused law journal, um, law review in the country. And I, I, I mean, that's one small step, but I think it's, it's a positive and good thing to be bringing further attention. And it was Completely very much student agree. I want you, oh, sorry, you had your hand up. Ago, um, I was on the founding board. I know. So. Right. <laughs> How's it going? Yes. It's going. I mean, it's it's uh, the great news is it's still going. It's got it's got ongoing leadership. It's they know they it's got my full support and um and that's exciting. But I also recognize it's it's a first step and that also there's a lot of journals and we need to create the energy to keep this one going and thriving. Just quickly, I just want to thank you for raising that issue. We didn't raise that issue when we were asked by the president what are some of the issues that the University of California itself should be and can focus on. And given the sheer number of issues that come up almost daily um, at the law school, at UCI, right, as we think through accessibility issues for our students, for our faculty, for our staff, I want to add that to the list of the things that as a structural way across every campus that we can figure out better and more ways to accommodate. So th I appreciate you raising that issue for all of us. Please, please, join, please join me in thanking our wonderful deans. And thanking our president. President Napolitano, one more time, too, for moderating and supporting.